Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I know there's some people who are still getting settled in and getting some refreshments, um, but I thought I would kick us off here. Um, thank you so much for coming to the Fall 2019 John Jay Research uh, Visiting Scholar Lecture. We are very lucky this semester to be hosting Dr. Sofia Grandakovska. We're really excited to hear from her today about some of the fascinating research that she's been working on while she's here at John Jay. Um, to give a proper introduction, I want to invite up Dr. Elise Waterston. She's the chair of the anthropology department. Thank you so much, and welcome everybody. It's what a delight to see you all here. Um, I think you're gonna you're in for a real treat. So um, I'm going to give you a formal introduction to Dr. Grandakovska, but first I want to share with you the first time I met her, which was in. Serbia, Belgrade, Serbia, what, two years ago now? Where I had gone to the university there to give a talk, a lecture kind of like this, and then we met for lunch afterwards, and she told me all about her research, and I just fell head over heels with what you're going to hear about this evening. And then she said, yeah, but you know, I'm here in Serbia, I'm from Macedonia, but I want to be in New York. So, after much wrangling, we have Dr. Grandakovska here with us this semester and today, so that's really wonderful. So, Dr. Grandakovska is currently visiting professor in the Department of Anthropology here at John Jay this fall semester, as I just said. She was named Senior Scientific Associate and Associate Professor at the SS Cyril and Methodius University in Macedonia in 2014, and she has an extraordinary record of achievement that includes sole author of three scholarly books. Since receiving her doctorate in 2009, Dr. Grandakovska has garnered major international recognition for her cutting edge research in the area of genocide studies, having discovered original archival documents of the Jewish tragedy in Macedonia. Among her accomplishments, Dr. Grandakovska has received major international awards from prestigious institutions in New York, in Israel, and in Serbia. She has produced important research and publications, and she has a proven record of innovative, innovative scholarly and applied research. Her research, as you can tell, centers on comparative genocide studies, the Jewish Holocaust in Macedonia and in the Balkans more generally, on migration, diaspora, oral history, and historical memory. Dr. Grandakovska's work crosses boundaries of art, literature, and social science, enabling her to be unique among cosmopolitan scholars with expertise in archival, qualitative, and quantitative research. She is a scholar and a poet. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sofia Grandakovska, whose lecture today is titled, The Archives Speak, Unearthing Traces of Catastrophe in Macedonia. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. I am humbled and honored by the words by Professor Alice Waterstone because if she did not initiate this uh, nomination as a visiting scholar at the Department of uh, Anthropology at John Jay College, I wouldn't have been here. And um, uh, I'm very happy to be here today, and I would like to thank, although he's not here now, to Dr. Daniel Stageman, Director of uh, Research at the John Jay College, who actually initiated this event. When we met, he asked me if I would be interested to give uh, a lecture as a visiting scholar this semester. And I would like also to thank Ms. Rachel Friedman, who took in her hands all the organizational phases. Uh, uh, 
regarding this event to be possible. And also I would like to thank to all of my colleagues uh, from the department and along with these words of gratitude, I would like to begin my today presentation. I will speak about the tra tragic event of Holocaust or about the tragic destiny uh, in 1943 of around 7,144 Jews from uh, Vardar, Macedonia. And Macedonia is, uh, as you were able to read in the short summary at the flyer, it is uh, located in the most peripheral part of uh, Europe, and I will show you where it is. It's here. This is this is a uh, map uh, from 1941, after the Hitler and his allies invaded Yugoslavia. Uh, Kingdom of Yugoslavia and Macedonia was part of it. So within this division came also the division of uh, Macedonia and the division was tripartite. First came Germans. It was uh, the so-called integrum period or period uh, where the atmosphere was prepared for two other occupations, simultaneous. Uh, the Bulgarian occupation, who occupied the farther part of Macedonia. That is this one, this part. This is all part of Bulgaria. And western part of Macedonia, which was occupied by Italians. But in the western part of Macedonia, we have dual politics. The civil authority, uh, was represented by the Albanians and the military authority was represented by Italians. Why Albanians? Because in 1939 uh, Albania was annexed to uh, Italy. So uh, I understand it's very complicated situation in regards of the geographical borders in regards of different occupying systems beginning uh, April 1941, but the division of Macedonia actually represented the fulfillment of uh, the Vienna Agreement that was signed on 22nd of April 1941. And uh, that's how after that, uh, Macedonia, uh, uh, Vardar part of Macedonia actually became part of uh, the Kingdom of uh, Bulgaria and Bulgaria named this part as a newly liberated territory because this territory was added to the already existing Kingdom of Bulgaria. Uh, now I would like to show you another map this one, you will see how Europe looked like in 1941. The which part, uh, different parts were occupied by different occupiers, but for us today it's important to see that Macedonia is here. And we saw the name Macedonia in the previous map, but now we do not see it. We read only Bulgaria. So the toponym of Macedonia ceased to exist. Uh, however, the people still live there in that farther part of Macedonia that now became newly liberated territory of Bulgaria. And with that, the main language became Bulgarian language citizens became Bulgarians, except the Jews. Uh, along with the Bulgarian language, 
There was Bulgarian flag, Bulgarian stamp, Bulgarian administration, and Bulgarian governmental laws. Bulgaria, in order not to enter in a war with uh, Hitler and Germany, became an ally of Nazi Germany and obliged itself to resolve the Jewish question in the territories under Bulgarian occupation and it in the older part of Bulgaria as well. Uh, now let's concentrate on this uh, map. It is actually the Vardar part of Macedonia that we were not able to see it as a toponym in the previous map. And in this part of Macedonia that was under Bulgarian occupation lived around 8,000 Jews. And uh, along with the Bulgarian occupation in April 1941, the law for protection of the nation was enforced in Vardar part of Macedonia and with that started social restrictions for the Jews. After that uh, came uh, restrictions for their movement. They were able to, to move, let's say, on this street but not on this street to buy bread. Uh, they were not allowed to buy bread before 10 o'clock in the, in the morning. Uh, after that came uh, the moment when they were deprived as citizens. They were not accepted as Bulgarian citizens, as other uh, citizens in uh, Macedonia. They were targeted, after that obliged to, uh, to attach the Star of, da of David. Their property was confiscated and so and so. And finally, they were uh, assembled in a, a temporary concentration camp in uh, Macedonia, in Vardar part of Macedonia, in Skopje, and were transported to uh, extermination camp Treblinka II in March 1943 and were uh, annihilated there. This is the map about the concentration and uh, extermination camps in that period. So the Macedonian Jews, let's say Skopje is here, Treblinka, you just go there. The deportation of Macedonian Jews was organized by the Bulgarian political elite, administration and police conducted by way of the Bulgarian railway from the temporary concentration camp monopoly in Skopje to the central railway line between Warsaw and Bialystok to the Malkinia station where the Treblinka camp was located or situated. Malkinia station was actually uh, only two kilometers away from the extermination camp Treblinka Two, because there was also Treblinka one, but it was a work camp. Uh, so here, the Macedonian Jews were imme immediately taken to an instant execution in the guest chambers. And now I would like to read to you one paragraph that I took from the trial that was led by Judge Zdislav Lukaskiewicz in March, on March 26, 1946. It is, it is written that it, took, it only took 30 to 45 minutes from the movement of the arrival of the victims to the camp ramp to the moment of the extermination of the victims. This estimate also included the hell in the gas chambers which lasted 15 minutes on average, while the whole transport train was annihilated within less than two hours. Thus the victims brought to Treblinka too, lived in fact less than another hour from the time they reached the camp. They were uh, guessed with carbon monoxide, 
let's say, in Auschwitz, uh, Cyclone B was used. So, after this deportation and extermination of Macedonian Jews, no single Jew has returned back. It's a continuation of all that I have said. I find it absolutely justified to ask, how do we speak about the Macedonian Holocaust when we deal with the syndrome of absent witness after Treblinka, or it is impossible witness? So I'm not speaking about the category of survivor. I'm speaking about the category of witness from Treblinka too. So I'm speaking actually about the fundamental attack on the act of the victim's speech so, because the victim is murdered and the victim cannot speak on his or her behalf about, the personal, about his or her personal experience. So we are dealing with the impossibility of materialization of the personal experience encountered in uh, Treblinka II into a testimony of any kind. I would like to explain a little bit more. In the period after the liberation of Macedonia, it was November 1944, around 200 uh, uh, survivors came back, but they don't have experience with the deportation. They, uh, uh, they uh, survived uh, using different strategies of survival. Let's say they were, they were released from the camp on behalf of their Italian, Albanian, or, or uh, Spanish citizenship. Some of the survivors that came back uh, uh, joined the, part the, uh, the partisans or the resistance movement. Some of them, let's say, with false documents, tried to, to escape to Albania, or they managed somehow to escape. So those, the deportation, so those who returned are survivors. But while I was speaking about the deportation of Macedonian Jews and their annihilation in Treblinka too, I'm speaking about impossible witness. Uh, so the survivors, their, their experience is not related to the deportation by the three train transport from the rail station in Skopje to Treblinka. The survivor actually remains out of any possibility to enter the experience of those who were deported. And thus, they stay out of the experience <coughs> related to Treblinka too. On the basis of these starting determina determinants, one could denote the existence of a distinctive relation between what I just said, impossible witness or one who never came back from Treblinka to tell his personal experience and the survival whose personal experience is not connected to Treblinka. This notion leads to the understanding that the trauma of speech of the victim in Treblinka remains a constitutional characteristic of the Holocaust in a history in Macedonia. The impossible witness is actually the lost voice or witnesses from, uh, are lost voices in Treblinka who cannot speak on their behalf, therefore, to speak about their experience as deportees in Treblinka. So here, at this point, comes the importance of the term archives speak in my title. The archival documents are very much important since they give us possibility to reconstruct the linearity of events that led to the annihilation of the victims in Treblinka. So I'm trying to point to the relation between the archival resources and the lost voices or impossible witness. We definitely cannot reconstruct the speech of lost voices because it presupposes 
how can I speak about someone's suffering when I don't have that experience? But we could not ignore the fact about the victims and with that about the lost voices. The archives help us to speak about all institutional preparations undertaken and, uh, regarding the solution of the Jewish question in Macedonia. Also, the archival material could not substitute the real, actual, human voice, but it's important to reconstruct the historical event of Holocaust, that it did happen in Macedonia, and how the victims became impossible victims. We all know that the term final solution of the Jewish uh, question is not only a semantical category. It includes institutional, systematic, strategic, planned, and methodical way of murder of the Jews. Behind the term final solution stays the motivation of the persecutor and that is to murder. But the murder must remain a secret. So the final solution means to murder and erase all the traces as if the murder have never happened. That is why it is from immense importance to speak about lost voices, about victims, who are not able to speak about their experience by their self. The next question I would like to ask is how the deportation of Macedonian Jews to Treblinka became a possibility, was possible to be maintained. Here we see the first page of the agreement for deportation of the Jews from the newly liberated territories. That was Vardar Macedonia, uh, Trace, or Northern Greece, and one part region, region from Serbia, that was uh, Pirot. They were all newly liberated territories of the Kingdom of, the Bulga of Bulgaria. So this agreement for deportation was signed between German and Bulgarian party. Uh, from Bulgarian side, it was signed by uh, Alexander Belev. He was commissar for the Commissariat of Jewish Questions. It was institutional body who took in its hands all the preparational phases for deportation. And on the other side, on the German side, uh, the, from the German side, the agreement was signed by SS Hauschtumführer Danecker, and uh, the document was signed on February 22nd, 1943 in Sofia. So this was actually an institutional guarantee that the Jews from newly liberated, liberated territory, in this case, from Vardar Macedonia are going to be deported and that region is going to be freed from Jews. Uh, the first sentence or the, the title is agreement that 20,000 Jews shall be prepared for evacuation from the new Bulgarian lands, Thrace and Macedonia and the German Reich is ready to take in these Jews in, it, in its eastern territories. That means that the Bulgarian authorities should prepare uh, the, uh, all the all phases regarding the transportation. So evacuation is euphemism. It is not just evacuation to evacuate something from, from this place to that place but evacuation was uh, euphemism for deportation and for annihilation. 
So the Bulgarians promise the evacuation and the German Reich says, okay, we are ready to take them. So that is the beginning of this, uh, of this agreement, institutional agreement. This, the next slide, uh, on this part, in the uh, next uh, slide, a uh, couple of slides, I put parts from the uh, agreement and I, each part, I, uh, I, to each part I add uh, uh, archival document in this way. This is uh, photography. It's about the police register from 1942. The, s the second part uh, of the agreement says the Bulgarian party takes upon itself the guarantee toward the, ger the German Reich that the evacuation shall start at the beginning of March 1943. Why did I put this uh, uh, police register here? Because before the, the deportation, the Bulgarian administration uh, targeted all the, all the Jews, they had already list of each Jews, and that registration actually first began as a police registration. These are very rare uh, police registers, and uh, one of them is uh, at the archives of Yad Vashem. Uh, the next slide, moves us to the next uh, stage of the preparation about the deportation. It says that before their depora deportation to the final destination, that is Treblinka, the Jews shall be assembled in concentration camp. So these two images that you see are actually, uh, the, uh, they pre represent the temporary concentration camp in Skopje. It, is, uh, it was a tobacco factory. That was, there were four buildings and they were rearranged to serve as a temporary concentration camp where Jews from all Vardar Macedonia were assembled on the 11th of March, 1943, and they stayed here until the moment of their deportation. The first deportation started on 22nd of March. The second train uh, left Skopje on 25th and the, the third train left on 29th of March. So the Bulgarians, the Bulgarian party actually fulfilled another part of the agreement that was signed before. Let's move, yeah. Their transport with special deportation train to destinated station shall be carried out at the expense of the commissariat. We said, uh, we, uh, I already uh, explained to you what is commissariat for Jewish questions. It is institutional body who organized all that is connected with the deportation and the transport. So this document <laughs> is very important. I found it by I mean, there is no coincidence, but I was very happy when I found it because it proves the deportation itself. We, uh, this document, it, it is from uh, October 13, 1943, so the period after the deportation, but it is a communication between the Commissariat for Jewish Questions and the Directorate of Bulgarian Railways and Ports. Actually, it is a uh, letter that the commissariat should uh, pay, should pay uh, the tickets for the deported persons. And we read, on March 25th, 1943, were transported 1,748 adults and 197 children, age, uh, the age between four and seven, from Jewish origin, from Skopje, to Treblinka. And in the second paragraph, we read, it is in Bulgarian, we read, on March 28, 1,797 adults and children from four to 10 years old Jewish origins from Skopje were deported to uh, Treblinka. Actually, this document 
speaks about the second and the third transport that happened from Monopole, from the camp in Skopje, to Treblinka. Uh, for every transport shall be drawn up a list of persons loaded on the transport. It shall include first name, last name, all important uh, details about each deportee. And these are very uh, extensive lists. I just put the cover page just to see uh, how it looks like. It is in Bulgarian. Also, after that, they are retyped in German. And uh, here in this list, we can see uh, uh, each Jewish person that was, every Jewish person that was deported. Here we read that they are, that they were children of uh, uh, age at, at age of four. Uh, 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 their number is 134 and so on and so on. So you see how precise uh, administration was taken regarding this transportation, deportation to that. Oh, what? Yeah. This is timetable about the special trains because uh, the, the transports and deportation to the uh, camps were organized to the, uh, through the special trains for resettlers. That was the Jews, that were the Jews who were on their way to their death. So this is also a very rare document as a confirmation, as a proof that really the transport and the deportation of these people happened. And the last part of the agreement is that under no circumstances shall the Bulgarian government ask for the return of the deported Jews. And that's how it happened. This is Treblinka, the place where they were taken, and the uh, site image down is actually the map about camp one and camp two. So this is about, uh, about the, the process of uh, deportation and how it was organized institutionally. But now I would like to elaborate less known uh, details about the implementation of this agreement. And uh, to that regard, I will come back to the, to the agreement and you see the second line and the line there, it is like crossed, it's crossed here, it's crossed. And I was always interested why. This is the uh, second part, this is the second page of the agreement and you see Alexander Bellet signed with black pencil and Daneker signed with green pen pencil. But I was always interested why in such a document, official document, it is, th some things are crossed line. Uh, I started to work on set of documents from the People's Court uh, about the trials after the Second World War in Bulgaria, in Sofia. And uh, among those millions and millions of documents, I found a trial and defense by the personal secretary of the Commissariat for Jewish questions uh, Alexander Belev. Her name is Liliana Vasilevna Panica and her defense is from March 12, 1945. And here actually in her defense I found the uh, answer for my question and also I found how the criminal was deep and deep and deep. So, 
this woman, Panitsa, in front of the court, first explained that this Belev was a member of the organization named Ratnitz, Ratnitsi, and actually it was the first organization that started the persecutions against the Jews in older parts of Bulgaria. After that, within time, this organization was institutionally extended to the legal body within the Ministry of Interior, and that legal body was actually the Commissariat for Jewish Questions. Uh, as Panitz, or the secretary of Belev, testified, she, uh, Belev manually drafted the agreement for the deportation around, for around 20,000 Jews from the newly liberated territory. After that, Belev gave the agreement to this Daneker, to his German colleague, and after it, through the Minister of Interior, Council of Ministers, the agreement was approved. It was signed between Belev and Daneker. But we see that these two parts in the agreement are crossed aligned. Actually, uh, why he crossed lined the, the number of 20,000 Jews. Because in the newly liberated territory, there were no 20,000 Jews. There were 11,343 Jews. So he had to add 7,000 Jews from the older parts of Bulgaria. He planned to deport the so-called Jewish elite like communists, rich people, Jewish leaders, and so on and so on. Uh, because Belev already signed the agreement that Bulgaria will deport Jews from uh, newly liberated territories, but he had to include more Jews because the number they were missing in the, in the agreement. That's why he crossed line the term newly liberated territories, and in that way, he opened a space to add 7,000 more Jews from the older parts of Bulgaria. And this should have been a secret in older parts of Bulgaria, because in that part, there was a strong resistance. Inst resistance, institutional resistance that was coming from the Holy Synod, uh, from the church, uh, from the lawyers, from artists, and so on and so on. They were protecting the Jews in older part of Bulgaria. Also, we find another interesting moment in this trial. From this interrogation, we are also informed that one original copy from the agreement was in Panitsa's house and that Belev gave her to keep it on safe. After the capitulation of Bulgaria, the police arrested Panica and found the original in her house. For, further one, we find something very interesting, namely, in the time of the interrogation, the court already had the original document. And after the agreement was signed by both sides, Belev crossed out these parts of the uh, agreement with the black ink, and in the way, in that way, the document became false. So the court stated the agreement for deportation of the Jews from the newly liberated territory is false document. The judge also addressed to Panica the following question: It is obvious, Belev made the intervention, intervention. She responded, yes, I know that Belev did that. After it, the court concluded that if Daneher, the German colleague, knew about this intervention, the agreement would have been rewritten. At the end, the judge asked Panica again, do you understand that this is a false document and is falsified by Bella. She responded, fundamentally, yes. 
So I would like only to repeat that the agreement for deportation and murder of 7,145 Jews from the other part of Macedonia, organized by Bulgarian officials and by way of Bulgarian railways, was false. It was falsified by the Bulgarian representatives. And here I would like to end my uh, uh, presentation. I put some uh, images. Uh, this is from the trial with Panica, with uh, the secretary. And uh, I put a couple of images that are uh, presenting the Jewish community in Macedonia, but before the war, they had different activities. Uh, this is the family of uh, Issa Kolonomos. They were all uh, murdered during the Holocaust. This is the Zionist organization that existed in Macedonia. Uh, the image is from, the picture is from 1927. Uh, the youth, the mandolin orchestra, sport, soccer team, the rabbi, Shabbatai Jain, and this is synagogue in Bitola that was destroyed, unfortunately. And this is a fragment from mosaic from the synagogue in Macedonia that originates from the second century AD, and it is one of the, if not oldest, synagogue on the Balkans. So thank you very much. I should go there. Stay here. Oh, okay. Stay here because now we're going to ask if uh, there are any questions. Maybe we can take this out and. Um, yes. Um, that's okay. Um, do you know? Um, do you know why um, the Bulgarians um, was the, the document was falsified? Was there a reason behind that specifically? Yeah, I I explained that that. Uh, in the agreement, it was written that 20,000 Jews from the newly liberated territories are going to be deported. But the Belef uh, uh, saw that there are no 20,000 Jews in the newly liberated territories. There are only 11,323. So, in secret, he wanted to include 7,000 more Jews from the older part of, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. To what extent um, contemporary Macedonian government, uh, Macedonian Bulgarian government of civil society tried to recognize this historical fact, if there are any kind of mobilization about it. I want to hear about it. Yeah. Good question. Political one. <laughs> uh, Can you repeat the question? Yeah. The question is uh, if uh, currently the Macedonian government and uh, organizations are doing something about these important facts about uh, the Holocaust history of Macedonian Jews. Unfortunately, nothing is going on on that uh, level. I remember last year uh, the Prime Minister of Bulgaria came on the day of commemoration of Macedonian Jews for the first time after 76 years after the deportation. And uh, in his, uh, through his words, we heard that uh, he deeply regrets about the deportation uh, who were, and for the Jews who were not able to save themselves from the Germans. But he never mentioned who the organizers were. So this speaks about distortion of history and at some degree denial, which is very dangerous, but present today.
Before World War II, what was the level of anti-Semitism in Macedonia? Uh, we cannot speak about institutional Semitism in open, because Macedonia was not an independent country, you know. It was part of the kingdom of uh, Yugoslavia, connected with Serbia. There was a Jewish federation. Uh, there were activities and things like that, if you think of the institutional level. But of course, there were, as always, anti-Semitic motivations that were coming from the local population. Or, But incid incidents were not uh, uh, recognized. Yeah, there are no traces. Uh, anthropologically speaking, you, you said that there were Spanish Jews. Of that population, what percentage were those Spanish Jews? Yeah. Actually, uh, after the expulsion from Spain and after that from Portugal, it was the period of Ottoman Empire, around uh, 13,000 Jews settled in Macedonia, uh, in Ottoman Macedonia. In that period, uh, uh, in, t uh, in three lo uh, local uh, localities or town cities, Monastir or Bitola, Skopje and Stip, and uh, they formed uh, strong Jewish communities that uh, uh, lasted or existed in continuation until 1943. Uh, also, in other cities, of Ottoman Macedonia. There were Jews, but uh, their percentage was very small, so uh, they were not able to form a Jewish community. Yeah. So most of them were uh, from Spain, from Portugal, they, are they were Sephardim. Also, there was percentage of uh, uh, Ashkenazim, but uh, uh, we can speak uh, to, to, uh, to a certain level about uh, Sephardic supremacy <laughs> because of their knowledge, language, their traditional, traditional way of, of uh, life. And uh, simply Ashkenazim, that they, they were in a small percentage, they accepted accepted the Sephardic culture and rit rituals and so on. Hi, um, I was wondering how is how the Holocaust and Macedonia studied today? Is it completely wiped out of the history textbooks or is it studied at all? Yeah, it is not studied at all. And uh, in the past, let's say, uh, the first two volumes of documents were published in uh, late 80s, after the war, in late 80s. And after that, uh, there was uh, one another book that was published by Alexander Matkovsky about Macedonian Jews. And after that, in 2011, I edited a book about Macedonian Holocaust. So. It is not uh, the topic that is willingly discussed, and uh, it's even not on the margins. <laughs> I have a quick question. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, your process in doing archival research and unearthing primary source documents? What is that like? <laughs> well. You go to the archive and you don't know <laughs> what you will find. Sometimes you expect to find, to you look for some documents, you don't find them, but you find something else. And it is a very interesting process. For me, it's like a game. And each uh, document presents certain puzzle of the story that you know certain facts, but you don't know where that story will lead you. And it's very interesting and very motivating. So I had privilege to find 
many, many documents, and s some of them were original. And really the feeling when you work with original documents or and with uh, photocopies is different. Because when you touch original document, especially, especially if it comes from the perpetrator side, you tremble. I mean, you tremble. Did you know that those were Jews or whatever? Like if, how, how, where do you go, and when you find something, how do you, what are some of the elements of the puzzle that you put together? Yeah. Well, um, in different archives, there are different collections. It depends what you, or what is the subject or topic of your research, and you first before that you 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 do research where. You, you can find the possibility to find that material. So, for example, about the material uh, and the research I was doing in Belgrade, uh, I worked on a very specific topic about uh, Macedonian Jews who lived there and were killed in the very early phase of the Holocaust, uh, beginning April 1941 and 1942 spring before the institutionalization of final solution. So I found that that documentation, part of that documentation, uh, that will lead me to the names of these people is going to be the archive of Yugoslavia. I went there, I asked the material from that font, 110, that is the number, and it was a census that was uh, done in Yugoslavia after the war in 1964, and I started to go through each census list. How did I know uh, that uh, uh, people that I find are those and that they are Jews? Because there was a specific part in, the, in each census list where usually uh, I was able to read the denomination of each person. So, and the place where that person was born. And these are the basic, let's say, elements of the methodology, research methodology that I applied for this certain research in Belgrade. Sometimes, let's say, at Yad Vashem, I was very much interested in uh, oral history, in testimonies, so you go in that, you go in that department and you just look for things that might be of your interest. It depends on the type of research, level, everything. Were there any um, runaway Jews, known runaways? Sorry? Were there any known runaways? Uh, from the deportation? No, no one uh, uh, escaped the deportation. But while they were assembled in the concentration, uh, temporary concentration camp in uh, Skopje, uh, around three or four Jews managed to escape the monopole and to, to join the, resist, the, the partisans or to hide somehow and to survive. Could you also talk about maybe um, when you were in the archives and reading all these other documents, um, maybe something else that you saw that is all, that was also just lost, I guess, in history. Something that you said, oh, this could be a completely other, I guess, side of the Holocaust that is also just not spoken at all. Something that you just didn't even know existed and you're like, wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's how actually the my research uh, <laughs> happens and uh, articulates itself. That's why I said when you go, you don't know what you can expect, what kind of documents. Also many documents, especially in the archives in Macedonia, are erased, they don't exist. 
and you know, let's say, you find some pieces in some literature, but you cannot find the document. But after that, you go somewhere, somewhere at some other archive, let's say in Israel, and you find something that is connected to that puzzle. So that's why I said you never know what you are going to uh, to discover. Yeah, for me, the greatest, I mean, uh, 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 the, 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 my latest ex excitement about this comes from my latest research that I did in Belgrade when I identified uh, victims, Macedonian Jews, that we di didn't know that they exist. We did not know their names. And after that, when I identified them, uh, I found the year of the uh, where they uh, when they were born where they lived who was the father uh, how uh, where they lived uh, in 1941 and 1942 either in belgrade or in zagreb or in other parts of uh, disembodied yugoslavia where they were murdered and who the uh, persecutors were so for me that was i mean the word excitement is not accurate because we're speaking about victims, but uh, I was uh, satisfied because I was able to add something to the unknown history to make it known. So, you know, um, while you're getting the other, I just want to say. Yeah. 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 Uh, here in New York, actually, I uh, discovered a set of documents about uh, uh, Jews who left Ottoman Macedonia. It was at the end of twentieth, uh, 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 at the beginning of twentieth century, and they migrated here. Uh, in New York, they established their community here in New York, Rochester, and Indianapolis. And uh, here at the center of Jewish history, I uh, discovered the list of those people and how I, I uh, discovered that list uh, when I uh, was uh, working on the documents regarding their congregation through their synagogue. And I found documents who the people who were the people who paid let's say uh for their membership for their membership or things like that so it was very exciting also to uh, to find the names uh, of these people because let's say they left macedonia in the period before and during the balkan wars 19 uh, third, uh, 12 and 13. Uh, it was before the, the Second World War. But since 98% of the Jewish population in Macedonia was annihilated in Treblinka, these Jewish uh, uh, com uh, members of this Jewish community uh, that I discovered in New York are their descendants. They are, they are the only survived uh, Jews from Macedonia, although they don't have uh, experience with Holocaust. They, not know. they did not know anything, anything about the deportation. They found it after it. Yeah. There are different uh, uh, paths of the journey of one document. It could be, it could stay hidden, <laughs> it could be erased, and you will never know anything. Uh, regarding, let's say, the Holocaust in Macedonia, the administration was Bulgarian, 
and partially uh, German. And after the liberation, when the Bulgaria, when the Bulgarian army retreated from Macedonia, they were taking all the administrative documents and uh, that they were producing. And the larger part of that documentation is, let's say, in uh, the archive in Sofia, in, in uh, uh, Belgrade, in uh, Bulgaria. Also, uh, during uh, that period, partially, a very small percent of uh, documentation about Holocaust was found in the Jewish community. And uh, that is, let's say, one way of preserving the documents from the Holocaust. Uh, in other archives, let's say in Israel, in Yad Vashem, uh, the librarians and the archivists have their collaboration. So uh, they all have their funds that are, uh, let's say, dedicated to certain issue from the history and to that regards about Macedonia. So most of the documents that I found in uh, uh, Yad Vashem, they are from Bulgarian provenance, obviously, and they were, uh, I found them in copies, in photocopies, you know. So there are different ways how one document goes to another archive. But, but it's very important, uh, the documents uh, to be preserved because uh, they, uh, they contain lots of information that is still hidden from all of us. We don't know many, many things that happened because I said the goal of final solution is to murder but all the traces to be erased. So. When you erase the trace, you erase the truth. I don't. Hi, uh, I was wondering what are some of the things that your critics say about your research and your findings? Sorry? Your, what are some of the cr things that your critics uh, say about your research and your findings? Uh, uh-huh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I'm honored that uh, I receive lots of appreciation and good words and support from my colleagues all over the world and from Bulgaria about my research. And my journey <laughs> towards this research, and it motivates me to work more and more and more, and to because my aim is not just to res to do the research as research, but my aim is to bring to awareness uh, to the people, to the students about this heavy issues, because they are repeating. They are repeating. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> so having parents from Macedonia, um, my parents are from Bitola and Prilip, so having parents from Macedonia and also being a part of the Roma Gypsy community, was there any evidence that you found in Macedonia that the Roma community was a part of the concentration camps? Zdravo. <laughs> She's from Macedonia. <laughs> uh, there is no research undertaken uh, regarding the Roma community in Macedonia during the Holocaust. But when I was uh, studying the law for, for protection of the nation, which in, includes the Jews. Uh, in part two, Roma people were mentioned that they are also target of this law. And this law was 
uh, voted in Bulgarian parliament and it was approved and it was published in official Gazeta in January 1941, before Bulgaria occupied Macedonia. So the Roma people are mentioned in this uh, 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 law, anti-Semitic, but uh, we don't know anything, anything about any single representative of Roma uh, community. I know that uh, there are more informations about the genocide over Roma people in Serbia, and that is connected, let's say, with the concentration camp, uh, Sajmište. So, that's it. I think we have time for one more question. Back here. So I'm, I'm not an expert on uh, the Jewish uh, Holocaust experience in general, but I am aware that some certain descendants of Jews that suffered the Holocaust have received reparations, yeah. uh, at least in Europe. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't sound like the Macedonian Jews or their descendants uh, could claim that if there is no real discussion about their experience mm -hmm. in that part of uh, old Yugoslavia. So if you could speak to that, and also if you could speak to any notion of uh, questions of reparations within the Macedonian Jewish population. Yeah, uh, there was a process of restitution in Macedonia, it was legal, it was approved by the government, and the fund for uh, the Jewish fund was uh, established, and what in 2005, and what was the uh, the goal of this uh, thing, that uh, all the Jews who perished during the Holocaust and do not have descendants, their property through this. Jewish fund was transferred, and the Memorial Museum of Holocaust was built in Macedonia with those money. Yeah. Last question. Uh, hello, thank you so much. Um, I'm so touched, yeah. I want to know like, um, if uh, other parts of Europe also had the partition like uh, Macedonia. Well. Oh. Um, I want to know if uh, like uh, other parts of Europe also had deportation like Macedonia? Yeah, yeah. It was all around uh, Europe and uh, around uh, 6 million Jews were murdered during the Second World War. The idea was uh, to murder all the Jews. That uh, Their number was 11 million. And, uh, but it was, the final solution was uh, partially successful. So there were deportations and annihilations to all Jewish communities over the, the Europe and the Balkans. And even the first uh, uh, established camp, Dachau, in 1933, he, although it was not uh, uh, an uh, extermination camp, but the first victims were also Jews, uh, along with communists, dissidents, and so on and so on. But uh, this was the agenda, this was the goal of, fi of final solution, to murder each single Jew on the earth. Yeah. 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 Ah. Yeah. 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 Uh, I read that uh, three days ago the Romanian genocide was uh, recognized by the American Congress, and about the Russia, 
uh, I found, uh, let's say, during the Second World War, many Russian Jews were transiting through Macedonia. Unfortunately, they did not survive, but they were trying to find safe place and survival in Macedonia. Yes, changing names, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. That's how actually my grandfather survived, <laughs> by changing his name. Yeah. It was one of the strategies of survival. Can I interrupt you, please? Because everyone's leaving, and I want to just say goodbye to everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, and um, lots of food for thought about bringing the past into the present. And um, maybe we can leave on that note. And I'm sure Sophia would be happy to talk yeah. to you further. We can't really hear you, so, it's, so that's why I yeah. apologize for cutting you off. But thank you, Sophia, very much. Thank Beautiful. You. Thank you. Thank you for your work.